Hello, I'm Karim Fizazi, medical oncologist from Gustave Rossi in Villejuif, France. I'm here in Barcelona for the ESMO 2019 meeting, which was really exciting with lots of good news for all the patients, for, uh, especially for men with prostate cancer. So I'm sitting here together with uh, esteemed colleagues from all over the world. Uh, I have uh, Shanin Sandu from Australia, I have uh, Dr. Bertrand Tombal from Belgium, and the local guy is uh, Dr. Joachim Matteo from here, Barcelona. So what, what I propose, you guys, is that we review the main data that we saw here at the Congress, maybe starting with localized disease and then uh, continuing with the patient journey as the disease progresses. And I think it's fair to say that even if it's a medical oncologist uh, congress, we saw a very important data regarding men with localized disease or biochemical failure post prostatectomy, and especially the role of radiation therapy. Bertrand, can you summarize this to you? Yeah, very please? important question. Huh? You remember 10 years ago, three trial that showed that adjuvant radiotherapy is better than no radiotherapy if you've got abnormal pathological features that are positive margin, PT3 disease, high Gleason, and also to some extent the seminal vesicle invasion, never tested the possibility of doing radiotherapy when the PSA is rising. Millions of discussion around the thousands of paper, no consensus, and now we can say next week, no, we have a consensus. Uh, one large trial, which is radical, UK-based trial, randomized patient, immediate adjuvant versus delay salvage, but at very low PSA level, 0.2, very important. And a meta-analysis, pre-planned meta-analysis, like we like to do now with the French GTAC trial and uh, Tasmanian radiotherapy group from Australia and New Zealand. And I mean, no, the case is clear. It's clearly uh, delay treatment. It doesn't seem to have a different effect. Uh, toxicity is the same, but the difference is that you save up to 60% of the patient. No, okay, we're treating maybe more aggressive patient, so in the end we may save a little bit less radiotherapy on modern patient, but still I think that no, my view is that the case is done if the patient has an undetectable PSA, no involvement of the lymph node, we should monitor the PSA and intervene rapidly. Question remain, should we use hormone or not? Still open discussion, but that's left to everybody's uh, right. own perception. Okay, so new standard of care is salvage radiation therapy, um, but let's carry on. Okay, let's say that all the patient had actually received salvage radiation therapy, PSA is rising. Let's say that we're deciding to use androgen deprivation therapy, and this is also something debated at the moment, but many people are doing it for the good or bad. And the patient is now progressing on ADT also with normal bone scan and a normal CT scan. So this is a M0 CRPC man. I think we, we saw here the data from uh, the data analysis uh, in the Spartan trial. Can, can you? Yeah, so the Spartan study, as you highlighted, was for a subset of patients with non-metastatic but castration-resistant prostate cancer. And they were randomized to apalutamide uh, and ADT versus ADT and, uh, and placebo. And essentially, that study had previously reported out a metastatic-free survival benefit. And here at ESMO, we saw an update on the overall survival data which certainly with additional follow-up showed uh, an, improve, uh, you know, an improvement of survival of 25%. Um, it didn't quite meet the, uh, the, the p-value based on the, the uh, O'Brien-Fleming criteria, but nonetheless, you know, in the right direction. So we wait, wait for more data as it emerges. Right, and actually you're, you're right, we should have more data from the two other trials, Prosper Correct. and Aramis. So in, say, one or two years from now, we will know whether clearly there is an overall survival benefit with these drugs. Yes. Uh, but, and it's fair to say that it really goes to the, to the good direction. Mm. Okay, good news again for all the patients. Now, another uh, very important setting of a disease is obviously that of de novo metastatic disease. Uh, this is responsible for perhaps half of the death in, in all our countries besides patients relapsing after lo local um, treatment. 
And uh, until, say, five years ago, we had nothing but ADT to propose to, to this gentleman. And if the field has changed dramatically. And I think we, we saw data, again, updated on data from Stampede regarding two questions, the stack cell and the role of radiation. Maybe let's start with the dust stack cell question. Can, can you summarize this for us? Please? Yeah, well, uh, I think that over the last few years, we have had tons of data of what to do in, in metastatic hormonized prostate cancer beyond ADT, right? And this, this study was, was actually was an update of the Stampede study of the stack cell arm, the Stampede study that show that Previous data is consistent with what they, what they are seeing now. So basically, they get a 20, 20 plus percent benefit in overall survival if you use the cetaxel early, six doses of the cetaxel, and then continue with, with ADT. Uh, and the soup analysis that they performed uh, was looking into whether they can identify groups that benefit more or less depending on the burden of disease of the patient at the beginning. And this is because other studies looking at the same strategy have shown that maybe patients with more metastatic disease benefit the most from the cetaxel. Actually, in the, in the stampede arm, the cetaxel arm didn't seem to bother too much about whether patients have more or less burden of disease. And I think there is something interesting that needs to be pointed out, and, and the authors pointed that out, that the population of the, of the cetaxel arm in the stampede study was different to other studies that have reported in the last few years because was enriched for patients that had the novo metastatic right. disease compared to relapse after several years. And who knows, maybe there is something in the biology of these patients that may explain the different behavior. Uh, however, I think that it's good that we have so many new options for patients with hormone-naive mm -hmm. metastatic prostate cancer, but we are still in a transition period until we understand who should receive what. Yeah, we, we're definitely missing a biomarker, mm -hmm. that, that's really for sure. But what, what do you think regarding the the debate as, as to whether we should use the stack cell or next generation hormonal agents, well, and regardless of access, because this is obviously very important in all countries, but let's say that we have access to, to both. What do you think we, we should use in, for, for most patients? To, what, what, what are your opinions? Well, I, I, I personally would favor a novel AR targeted agent. I think they, uh, you know, but you, you have to take in uh, patients preferences quality of life a whole range of other things as well some people may opt to have six doses of docetaxel and be done with it mm -hmm. um, but you know I think the data around although there isn't head-to-head uh, -head data sort of comparing uh, novel AR targeted agents versus docetaxel certainly it is compelling the, the data on upfront uh, AR targeted agents right. in this setting mm -hmm. so that would be my perspective okay. but you know the personal preference of the individual yeah. also comes into it. Very reasonable. Bertrand? I think uh, at least in my area the economy of it is very important also so uh, clearly uh, I think what we learn is you, you need at least one line of both. You need one line of the, you need docetaxel and you need one of these two agents. So uh, when we speak to patients, you say you know it, it's not about one or the other. It's about you you want to start with this one or do you want to start with that one. Then you have patients who start with the hormone, hoping that they never need hormone therapy. We know that's never going to happen. And you have patients who say. I better get chemo now, and we see, so it's really, really, we're trying to understand, could we predict the response of the patient? No. It's so hard. It's, but I think well, one of the problems of this debate, we tend to forget that we should tell the patient, you're going to need both. That's right. And, and actually, uh, eventually, we might use both. At the same up time. Up front, yes. Yeah. I mean, we probably not now, because we don't have level one evidence for that. But eventually, with enzymatic updated analysis, PS1 and, and, and aracens, we'll see. Maybe we will. But let's focus on on these men with uh, calcium sensitive metastatic disease. We also saw updated data from from Stampin regarding the local treatment the radiation question. What, what do yeah. you think? So that, that's another uh, monster of the Loch Ness. That you know that for every urology meeting, you had millions of discussion, should we treat patient with positive lymph node, uh, and then came PET-PSMA, should we treat patient with oligometastatic node, the UK has put the bar very high at one stage because they clearly showed that up to three metastases on a bone scan, CT scan, you got a benefit. So uh, From local treatment. Yeah, so all these discussion now have become a little bit uh, obsolete and we should now focus on other discussions which to me are important, 
when you use radiotherapy, should it be a doublet? Do you have to add also AB and ZA? APA that we don't know. They might get registration in that setting, mm -hmm, so correct. we don't know. Uh, and the second is, do we have to treat the oligometastatic deposit? But I think that as for the guideline, we should consider that up to three metastases, you need to Look have the primary it. treated. And we, we should focus on the next question, which are more important. I agree. Okay, fine. Let's carry on. Patient is progressing with castration-resistant disease and you now, now have a metastasis. So we've been using AR targeting and taxane or uh, the tax health for a long time now. But I think we, we saw very important data at this Congress, and perhaps for the first time we're aiming towards precision medicine uh, for patients with HRD or DDR uh, positive cancers with a profound trial. Shanine, what can you explain us? Yeah, so I, I think this, you know, this for, for me was one of the highlights of, of ESMO for men with prostate cancer because it's a game changer. We're starting to personalize treatment for men, as you said. And we're also learning to uh, molecularly stratify the disease, start to sort of take the primary tumor or metastatic deposit, sequence it, identify the uh, genomic aberrations in the HR pathway and other DNA repair pathways that are relevant and then try to be more precise about treating those men. And I think, you know, this is where lung cancer and, and breast cancers and many other cancers have gotten to. And we're just starting to have our foray uh, in this space. And so it's very exciting. Um, the, the data itself, um, you know, is exciting in the sense that it showed an improvement in progression-free survival, um, a significant proportion of patients that were randomized to the novel AR targeted agent uh, were, were crossed over to receive uh, aberatron on the back of progressing and you know there was a improvement in survival. You mean well. laparib? That's correct, yep. So uh, the, the design of the study essentially was patients were randomized to um, laparib or either abiraterone or enzalutamide, depending on what novel AR targeted agent these patients had had before. Uh, the vast majority of patients had had prior exposure to an, you know, uh, chemotherapy in addition to one of these AR targeted agents. And we saw good benefit, and so that is proof of concept that we can look at a molecular target and use a drug that is effective in this space. And you know, I would say, um, given the molecular target, I, my expectation is we should be looking at moving these sort of drugs earlier as a combination strategy. Fantastic. Joachim, the two of you have been working really on, on Vesfiel for a while now, so, so I think it's a reward actually mm -hmm. to, for, 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 mm -hmm. for you guys. So, but what, what, what do you think? Were, were you expecting this degree of efficacy based on the previous experience in the phase two program with Volaparib or with other drugs, that, uh, with other PARP inhibitors? Yeah. What, what do you think? I th Any surprise, good or bad? I mean, obviously, we're very happy. We think sure. this is one of the highlights of the Congress, but obviously I'm biased because as, as you two guys have been heavily involved in, in this project before. Uh, and it's a good news. It's good news for patients. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say a surprise, but clearly a reassurance that what has been observed in other studies and actually on, on Sunday morning we saw preliminary data on other two PARP inhibitor trials that all point towards the same direction are reassuring that uh, this strategy works. So I think that my take home message is that we are bringing a new therapeutic option for some patients with metastatic prostate cancer. But even beyond that, that the concept works, that the concept of stratifying the disease into subgroup could help to treat some Absolutely. patients better. It's not perfect. No. And we have to admit that. Uh, we still don't know all about how to make it right. Clearly, the patients with BRCA mutations benefit a lot, and within the others, it may be less unclear who is benefiting more, who is benefiting less. Maybe we'll end up having subgroups within the subgroups, and that will make it a bit complex. But um, overall, I think we can be quite confident that this is a strategy that is going to help a significant number of patients. Very nice. Bertrand, do you think all the societies will have a hard time integrating a test uh, or not, or do you think this is, I mean, given the, the magnitude of the benefit, 
the societies should just adapt and uh, and find ways to to make those tests in the academic world um, cheap and easy to get. What, what do you think? I think that th there is a logistic behind that. Okay, mm -hmm. that uh, so far everybody knew that at some point we would have to embark into uh, actually recommending the test, but always waited that we get the result. So now we got the result. How do we move forward? It comes with a cost. It comes with uh, a logistic. So we're going to have to be uh, smart, not repeat mistake we did. And that I think every country should really put in place a system to identify the patient we need, have standard procedure and provide as fast as possible. But, but still, uh, I remember when uh, IRESA came on the market for lung cancer, uh, the same company which is making uh, Olaparib realized that uh, lung cancer doctor had no idea how to process the tissue and send it for EGFR mutation. So we don't want to repeat that. Absolutely. So very, I mean, just great efficacy data with Olaparib that we saw in the profound trial. What about the toxicity profile of a drug or, or may, even more generally there's families of compounds. C can you explain what we see in the, in yeah, in the so, clinic? Um, as a class of compounds, you know, there are a number of PARP inhibitors that are being developed in prostate cancer. So Olaparib um, we, we is, you know, furthers on in the development in terms of phase three data, but there are other PARP inhibitors like niraparib and rucaparib and telazoparib. And as a class of drugs, they tend to have um, a spectrum of side effects, uh, slightly different half-lives, slightly different PARP uh, trapping abilities. But broadly speaking, they tend to cause some GI toxicity, so a little bit of nausea, a little bit of early satiety, um, constipation or sort of, you know, f f a sense of fullness in the stomach. Um, and they cause hematological toxicities. And I think... Um, Generally speaking, they're really quite easy to manage, and you know these are drugs. Certainly, olaparib is a drug that has been around for a very long time, has been used broadly in in ovarian cancer and breast cancer. Now, our turn to have the experience of using olaparib. Um, you know, we need to learn to manage some of these side effects with treatment breaks as well as dose reductions. And I think it is important that there there is a you know it's a, you know, there are some manuscripts coming out. There's a lot of granularity d detail about the dose, dose reductions and the treatment breaks. Okay. Joachim, is that your clinical experience also? Those two main toxicities, but not big? Correct. I, I think that even also compared to the trials in ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. we are seeing a bit less of GI toxicity and primarily anemia mm -hmm. is the main problem, but it's something that is relatively easy to manage with dose reductions and interruptions. Not that often you have a patient where you have to definitely stop treatment right. because of the anemia. Um, I mean, as a new class track in, in the field, we, it will require some time for sure. all, us all to, to get used to it, but I think that is manageable. Right. Would you say to all our colleagues that it's easier to manage as compared to the hematotox we see with chemo generally, or what do you think? Correct. It's different. Hematological mm -hmm. toxicity from chemotherapy is like a peak, right? Yeah. And you know it will recover. Mm -hmm. This is something that will kick in slowly, mm -hmm. but then also with a break, normally patient recovers by itself. For me, the, the most relevant factor to predict the risk of anemia of a patient would be the burden of metastatic disease in the bones. So it's also true that if new trials come and suggest that this drug can be used in earlier stages of the disease or earlier lines of therapies, mm -hmm. probably it will be, make it even easier to manage because we will have patients with less, less burden, burden of bone metastatic yeah. disease. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So um, I think we've heard also some have a good news here at the Congress, another phase three trial uh, comparing uh, cabazitaxel versus a second AR targeting agent, uh, the CARD trial. Can you s briefly summarize the, the, the design and, and the m most important findings? So CARD was an international study randomizing patients who have progressed on aviraterone or enzaludamide mm -hmm. to receive either cabazitaxel or enzaludamide or aviraterone, whatever they had not been received before to see if the sequence of novel hormonal agents was better or worse than actually changing to chemo. Uh, the patients were selected in part based on the time they had had aviorenza for, so patients who had 
very long responses were not included in this trial, mm -hmm. which may have to be taken into account when interpreting the results. But overall, the results were very positive, and it was shown that after progression of normal and agent switching to chemo, prolongs PFS and also overall survival of these patients. This is something that actually in many places is already happening as a standard of care because in some healthcare systems we don't even have access to a second NHA, but in some other countries it's not. And I think that this data is very important to set the mark for the guidelines to treat these patients. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm totally with you. Actually, we were participating to the trial, and for most patients who were candidate, we thought that ethically, because we had access to cabazitaxel, we were not randomized. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually put a minority of all the potential patients in the trial just because we, we thought it was not ethical. Just, you know, patients where you were wandering, who were plus or minus fit for chemo or long period of time on AR, so maybe a second AR might work, we, we, we randomized those ones. But uh, hmm. I'm, I'm actually I'm glad that we have clarity on the clarity. subject. Yes. Of course. And, and having said so, it's true that trials are always designed for five, six years before, right? And so many things have happened in the field of metastatic Absolutely. prostate cancer, oh, yeah. but it still is very important that the data says clearly what's best for Absolutely. this patient. Sh Shannon, do, do you use broadly cabazitaxel in Australia? Is that a confirmation yeah. or yeah, how so does it work? I, my practice is very much like you. You know, mm -hmm. I think I would have been challenged to randomize those patients just because it makes you know, there is there was some r multiple retrospective series that had em had emerged that suggested an AR targeted agent on the back of uh, prior exposure does not make a lot of biological sense, uh, and so you know, the bias has always been towards switching to chemotherapy. So that would have been my practice, and yes, we use a lot of cabazitaxel. Okay, yeah. very nice, and a lot of PSMA lutetium now. Yes, increasingly. Yes. So that's you have the, an ongoing that, trial comparing yeah, so the two. So actually, we have a, an ongoing uh, trial that has completed recruitment in a very short space of time. Oh, wow. Uh, comparing the next, uh, you know, next possible uh, promising therapeutic agent for men with prostate cancer, so looking at lutetium PSMA versus cabecitexel, and hopefully we'll get a readout of that study in the next year. Fantastic, excellent, yeah. congratulations. Yeah. Wow, any other important message that you would like to briefly discuss regarding the SSMO? How we are? I think the main message is that um, if we have active agent, we, we should not delay their administration. And that so audio really, is better. really, 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 uh, we've been doing AR pathway after AR pathway and that uh, we should stop. Right. Unless it's a very specific end of life situation, we need to move quicker okay. and monitor the patient. And right. if we have an active agent with a known target, we should not hesitate. Okay, thank you. So I guess it's fair to say that this ESMO shed some light on one, two, three different situations the post-prostatectomy situation with positive margins, we should not use post-operative radiation, we should defer that. Also for castration-sensitive metastatic setting, the role of those tag cell, which is for de novo patients at, at least, uh, true for both high burden and low burden, but unfortunately not super uh, impressive with just 19% reduction in the risk of death. And also, as we just said, for CRPC pretreated, the role of cabazitaxel is getting clearer now. And on top of that, and probably most important, we have some new data regarding Olaparib, which is really new. And again, as we said, for the first time, the this is personalized medicine, and we were dreaming about it for basically a decade. So it's a very important day for prostate cancer research. Okay, so having said that, I would like to thank you uh, all three for this uh, really stimulating uh, um, discussion, uh, and thank you uh, to all of uh, to all of you. Sorry for listening to us uh, today. Thank you. Bye bye.